Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on vibrations and waves. The topic of this video is a vibrating mass on a spring, and we want to know how does the force, acceleration, speed, position, and kinetic and potential energy of a vibrating mass on a spring change over the course of its cycle. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Suppose that we have a spring and we hang it from a vertical support. The spring would stretch out to a natural length of L. If we were to apply a force to the spring by perhaps adding a mass to the end of it, the spring coils would begin to stretch and the spring would assume a new length that is equal to the original length L plus an additional stretch distance X. The spring is applying a force on the mass to balance the force of gravity that acts upon the mass. The direction of that spring force is in the opposite direction that the spring stretches. We can apply different forces to the spring by adding different masses and get different stretch distances. By collecting a data set of spring force versus stretch distance, we could determine the relationship between the two quantities. The relationship is known as Hooke's Law and has, the equa has an equation of F spring equal negative K times X. The constant of proportionality in this equation is known as the spring constant. It has units of newtons per meter or newtons per centimeter. Meter. It depends upon the spring that we use. The x in the equation is the stretch distance, but since springs can both stretch and compress, we more generally refer to x as the displacement of the spring from its natural length or natural position. The negative in the equation is there because the direction of the spring force is in the opposite direction as the displacement. Suppose we have a mass attached to a horizontal spring and placed on a friction-free table. If the spring is in its relaxed state, then we would call the position of the mass at this location the equilibrium position. If we stretch the spring by pulling the mass back to the right and then release the mass from rest, we would observe the mass begin vibrating back and forth between its two extremes. We'll call these three positions of the mass A, B, and C. A and C are the two extreme positions, and B is known as the equilibrium position. At position A, the spring is stretched, and the displacement of the spring is to the right. Thus, the spring applies a force upon the mass directed to the left. At location C, the spring is compressed. The direction of the displacement is to the left. Thus, the spring applies a force upon the mass at location C that is directed to the right. At location B, the spring is in its relaxed state. Thus, there's no displacement and no spring force. We can use this information to construct free body diagrams for the mass when it's at locations A, B, and C. At the far right location, location A, there's three forces acting on the mass. The gravity force down and the normal force up balance each other. But the spring force is unbalanced and thus the net force. It's directed towards the left, back towards the equilibrium position. We sometimes refer to this force as the restoring force because it restores the mass back to equilibrium. At location B, there's only two forces. There's no spring force since the spring is neither stretched nor compressed. But the gravity force down and the normal force up balance each other. There's no net force at this location. At location C, the leftmost location, there's three forces. The gravity and the normal force balance each other, and the spring force is the unbalanced force directed to the left. This spring force is again the restoring force that restores the mass back towards its equilibrium position. For these three positions, the net force at location A is to the left, and at location C it's to the right. There's no net force at location B since the force is balanced. Now let's consider a vertical spring in its relaxed, unstretched state. This location of the spring is the x equals zero location since the spring is not stretched. Now let's suppose we hung a mass on the end of the spring and slowly lowered the spring downwards to its rest position. At this position, position B, the upward force of the spring on the mass balances the downward force of gravity. We thus call this the equilibrium position. It's important to note that for a vertical spring, the equilibrium position is the position where there's some stretch in the spring and a spring force unlike the case for horizontal springs. Now let's suppose we pulled downwards up on the mass to position A and we release the mass from rest. That mass would begin to vibrate back and forth between its two extremes A and C, about the equilibrium position B. 
At all three of these positions, A, B, and C, the spring is stretched, and because it is, there's an upward force of the spring upon the mass. This upward force of the spring is combined with the downward force of gravity, but they're not necessarily equal to one another. In fact, at location A, the upward force of the spring must be greater than the downward force of gravity in order to have a restoring force directed towards the equilibrium position B. And at location C, the downward force of gravity must be greater than the upward force of the spring so that there's a net restoring force downwards towards the equilibrium position. We can use this information to construct free body diagrams for locations A, B, and C. At location A, the spring force is greater than the gravity force. It makes sense that the spring force is greatest at this location since the stretch of the spring is greatest at this location. At location B, the two forces equal one another, the spring force up and the gravity force down. And finally, at location C, the spring force is the smallest of all three positions since this is the location where the spring stretch is also the smallest. Thus, you end up with a greater gravity force than spring force and a downwards restoring force directed towards the rest position. As the mass on the spring vibrates back and forth, it encounters changes in speed and acceleration. The speed will be zero at the two extreme positions, A and C, when the mass is in the process of changing directions, and the speed will be greatest at location B, the so-called equilibrium position. We can think of it like this. As the mass moves from location A towards location B, it's moving in the direction of the net force. Since the force is in the direction of motion, it speeds the mass up. The same thing is true as the mass moves from location C to location B. It's moving in the direction of the net force, and thus it will be speeding up. But as the mass moves from the equilibrium position B towards its extreme positions, it's moving in a direction against the restoring force. Thus, the restoring force slows it down. For the case of the vertical spring, we have a similar reasoning. As the mass moves from location A towards location B, it's moving in the direction of the restoring force. Thus, the mass would speed up from A to B. The same is true as it moves from C to A. It's moving in the direction of the restoring force and thus speeding up. But as the mass moves from the equilibrium position towards the extreme positions, it's moving against the restoring force and will be slowing down. We get the exact same thing for the vertical situation as we do for the horizontal situation. As for acceleration, it's always in the direction of the net force and always proportional to the net force. That would mean that the acceleration is zero at location B where the restoring force is zero, and the acceleration will be greatest at locations A and C where the restoring force is the greatest. And as for the direction of the acceleration, it's always directed towards location B. It's because the restoring force is always in that direction. Like any situation involving simple harmonic motion, there's a sinusoidal relationship between the position and the time and the velocity and the time. Here's the position time graph for a mass vibrating back and forth between locations A and C. This graph presumes the reference frame in which the rightward direction is the positive direction, the leftward direction is the negative direction, and the zero position is the wall to which the spring is attached. On the graph, the midpoint of the sine curve represents location B in the diagram above me, and location A would be the high points with the extreme positions of 0.5 meters from the wall, and location C would be the points that are closest to the wall and thus located at about the 0.1 meter mark. For our mass vibrating on the horizontal spring, the velocity time graph would look like this. In order to identify the locations A, B, and C on this graph, it would be helpful to recall that the velocity is zero when the mass is at locations A and C, the two extreme positions, and the speed is the greatest when the mass is at location B. That would mean that on this velocity time graph, the high points would be locations B, 
and the low points would also be location B. The high points are when the mass is at location B and moving in the positive direction, and the low points are when the mass is at location B and moving in the negative direction. Now we have to identify locations A and C. Those are obviously on the V equals zero line, since that's the velocity when the mass is at locations A and C. Now to identify which is which, it would be helpful to recall that as the masses move from A to B and C to B, the masses are speeding up. And as the mass moves from B to A and B to C, the mass is slowing down. So let's consider the trajectory from B to A to B. Let's suppose the mass is at B, moving in the positive direction towards A and slowing down. Then at A it turns around and moves back in the negative direction towards B and speeds up. That must mean that A is the first and the third point on the V equals zero line. Let's see if that makes sense now. At B, the mass has positive velocity. I'm reading that off the graph. And in the next about 1.5 seconds, that velocity is still positive but approaching zero. That's what happens when the mass moves from B to A. Now let's do the A to B on the graph from about 1.5 seconds to about 3 seconds. The mass is moving from A to B in the negative direction now, so the line is below the graph. And it's getting faster, and so the line is getting further and further from a V equals zero mark. So location A must be the first and the third point on the graph. As for location C, that must be the second and the fourth point on the graph. Let's see if that makes sense now. Let's go from about three seconds on the graph to a little past six seconds. That's from B to C to B. Let's compare it to the diagram above. On the diagram, going from B to C to B would be first moving in the negative direction to the left and getting slower. And then from C to B, it's moving in the positive direction and getting faster. And that's exactly what this graph shows B to C, the line is approaching V equals zero, it's slowing down, and it's got negative velocity. And going from C at about five and a half seconds to B at a little past six seconds, the mass has positive velocity and is getting a bigger and bigger velocity, moving to the right and speeding up. As a mass on a horizontal spring vibrates back and forth between locations A and C, there will be changes in kinetic energy and elastic potential energy. What you need to know is that at locations A and C, the V is zero and the amount of stretch of the spring is greatest. And at location B, the V is a maximum and there's no stretch of the spring. So what we know about kinetic energy is that it depends upon speed. So it will be greatest when the mass is at location B. Elastic potential energy depends upon the amount of displacement of the spring. So it's going to be greatest where the spring is stretched or compressed the most. That's location A and C. So we can reason that as the mass moves from location A to B, the speed is increasing, but the stretch is decreasing. So the potential energy would be decreasing and the kinetic energy increasing. And as the mass moves from B to the extreme position C, the amount of stretch of compression of the spring would increase. That means potential energy is increasing, but the mass is slowing down, the kinetic energy is decreasing. As the mass moves from C back towards B, it's speeding up and the amount of compression of the spring is decreasing. So potential energy is decreasing and speed is increasing. In the final part of the cycle, as the mass moves from B to A, the speed's decreasing, so so is the kinetic energy, but the amount of spring stretch is increasing, so so is potential energy. For a mass vibrating on a vertical spring, one must also consider the gravitational potential energy changes. The kinetic energy is still speed dependent and therefore greatest at position B. The gravitational potential energy is height dependent and greatest at location C. The elastic potential energy is X dependent, dependent on the amount of stretch of the spring, and thus greatest at location A and smallest at location C. So as the mass vibrates from location A towards the equal equilibrium position at B, the elastic potential energy is decreasing since the stretch is decreasing. The gravitational potential energy is increasing since the height is increasing, and the kinetic energy is increasing since the speed is increasing. 
As the mass continues to vibrate upwards towards location C from location B, the amount of spring stretch is still decreasing, so so is the spring energy. The height is increasing, so the potential energy gravity is increasing, but the speed is decreasing, so the kinetic energy is decreasing. As the mass vibrates from location C back towards location B, the amount of stretch is increasing, so the spring energy is increasing. The height is decreasing, so the potential energy gravity is decreasing, and the mass is speeding up, and so the kinetic energy is increasing. Finally, as the mass completes its cycle, moving from B back to A, the amount of stretch of the spring is increasing, so so is the spring energy. The height is decreasing, so so is the potential energy gravity, and the speed is decreasing, so so is the kinetic energy. Now let's discuss the energy bar charts for our mass vibrating on a horizontal spring. Location A was the location where the spring was stretched a lot and there was no speed. And so when we draw the bar chart for location A, we would show a lot of potential energy due to the spring and zero kinetic energy. The third bar in green is the total mechanical energy, the sum of the two forms. At location B, this mass has the greatest speed, but there's no stretch in the spring. So we're going to show a full bar of kinetic energy, but no potential energy due to the spring. You'll notice that the green bar, the total mechanical energy, is simply the sum of the two forms. Location C is much like location A since there's no speed and a maximum compression of the spring. So we show a full bar of potential energy due to the spring, but no kinetic energy. The total mechanical energy is the sum of the two bar heights. Now what we notice when we analyze this situation is that as the kinetic energy is increasing, the elastic potential energy is decreasing, but the total mechanical energy remains constant. The opposite can be said as well for when the kinetic energy decreases, the elastic potential energy increases, but the total mechanical energy once more remains constant. The period of vibration indicates how much time it takes the mass spring system to complete its back and forth cycle of vibration, whereas the frequency refers to the, how often that mass spring system completes its vibration. The period of a mass spring system depends upon the spring constant of the spring and upon the mass of the vibrating object. The equation that expresses this dependency is T for period equal 2 times pi times the square root of mass per K. This indicates that more massive objects would have longer periods, whereas a stiffer spring with a larger K would have a shorter time period. The frequency of vibration is the reciprocal of the period and can be calculated from the period equation by going one divided by the right side. That indicates that the frequency F is equal to the square root of K divided by M divided by the quantity two times pi. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website. I've left links to each in the description section of this video. You have a simulation page, you have four different concept builders on springs, and you have a tutorial page. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H and I thank you for watching.